Hey, what's going on, guys? It is Thursday. We are here. And Thursday, the day before, the last Thursday of uh, before the elections, right? I hope everybody's voting already. 70 plus million people have voted already. That's incredible. I think it's an amazing sign. But listen, today we have a great show for you. We have our Carrica and Romero segment. And that's going to be amazing because we know we love Christina and Kenneth. And they break it down every month. The last Thursday of every month, they break down all the political news. And we need a lot because there's so much different messaging coming our way. Whether it's real, whether it's fake, those are the things we're going to have to break down. So listen, Christina and Kenneth will see them soon. And that, also we have Tony, Tony Navarrete, who is a state senator from Arizona. Mexicano brother from Arizona. So can't wait to talk to him because he's up for re-election. Um, on November 3rd, his name will be on the ballot. So I want everybody to know who he is because he is definitely a bright, bright future in the political world. And he's just an amazing guy. So for today's cocktail, signature drink is going to be none other than El Presidente, right? All eyes on that president seat. So we are going to do Presidente. We are going to stir it. So get your stir ready. Um, first, have your martini glass ready. A little bit of ice so it can freeze very nicely. We're going to start with some Angostura bitters. Just a couple of dashes right there. You always start with the least expensive drink. You're going to take your bar spoon and you're going to bar spoon grenadine. One right there. Beautiful. Then we take the orange curacao, and we're going to do three quarters of it, all right? And that's delicious because it gives a beautiful, beautiful orangey taste. Then we're going to take some dry vermouth, and we're going to do a full ounce of dry vermouth right in there. And then we're going to do two ounces of aged rum. So you can do brugal, you can do bacardi. H rum in there, beautiful. Then we're going to stir. And guys, this is really nice. It's a really great dry but equal drink. Um, you want to dilute it for about 15, 20 seconds. It is going to be delicious. And you know what? Hopefully this next president be a little more like this beverage equal. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So, all right, let's taste that. Ooh, guys, you're gonna love. All right, so we're going to take our martini glass. We are going to dump it. And I have a little bucket here, so I have to go over there. You have your martini glass. And then we're just going to strain this beautiful drink. Mm, look at that. Doesn't that look delicious, you guys? And so necessary for this Thursday, this rainy Thursday in New York City. <laughs> so the way we're going to garnish this is with a beautiful orange peel. Cut it, you want to twist and get those beautiful juices in there. And then you're just going to take your garnish and twist, twist, twist. You want to get that little springy curl in there. And then you're going to put that right in your beverage. And there you are, guys, El Presidente. And I am going to taste it. Mm. Oh, wow. With Christina. And tennis is going to be on. <laughs> it's going to be on today. The conversations are going to be amazing today, guys. Again, we are going to be talking about the top 10 reasons why your vote counts, right? And Latinos out there, pay attention. Everybody out there, pay attention. There's so much at stake. So listen, let's get started right now. I'll see you in a minute. Salud.
Buenas noches, mi gente. What's going on? Good evening, my people, and welcome back to Conciencias con Cocktails with me, Javier Pedrosa. I like to start by saying thank you to all of you, each and every one of you, for tuning in today and every Thursday at 6 p.m. on Celebrity.com, Celebrity Latinx, also on Celebrity's Magazine's channel on YouTube, Facebook Live, and Twitter. If you're watching on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube Live, comment. And if you have any questions during the show, by all means, let us know and we will try to answer them for you. Also, be sure to follow us on IG at Conciencias con Cocktail. So guys, we're in our last week of October and we are five days away from the final day of voting, which is November 3rd, just in case. And sadly, you know, guys, yesterday, the United States reported more than 80,000 new coronavirus infections and over 1,000 new deaths. The White House Corona uh, Task Force warned in an internal report that there is going to be an unrelenting broad community spread in the Midwest, Upper Midwest, and the West. Every state in the U.S. is either holding steady or seeing an increase in new cases, with the U.S. headed for a third surge that is said to be the two previous peaks. Crazy, right? So even more crazy, you know, the campaign trail number 45 continues to rally his supporters, packed events, uh, all live, where few people are wearing masks. Yesterday, we'll talk up to this with Tony, because this is Arizona, but yesterday, Wednesday, Trump traveled to Arizona where he mocked a statewide mask mandate ordered by California Governor Gavin Newsom, saying, and I quote, in California, you have a special mask. You cannot, under any circumstances, take it off. You have to eat through the mask, end quote. <laughs> Interestingly enough, his remarks came at a as, as a new study from Vanderbilt University researchers found coronavirus hospitalizations rose dramatically in places without local mask mandates compared to places where a large majority of people wore face coverings in public. So yesterday's top infectious disease scientist, Dr. Anthony Fauci, made his strongest comments yet in favor of a nationwide mask mandate. Dr. Fauci said, and I quote, let's put aside these extraordinary excuses for not doing it when we're dealing with a situation that's not trivial. You know we have 225,000 deaths. The modeling tells us we're going to get 100 or more thousand as we get into the winter. That is just something that's unacceptable, end quote. And you know, last week, a study in the Journal of Na uh, Nature Medicine found universal mask wearing across the U.S. could save nearly 130,000 lives by the end of next uh, February. So please wear your mask, guys. Everyone, you know, I'm really excited for today's show because we get to chat and highlight uh, three forces who have made significant impacts in their own amazing ways. Uh, with us live, we have our Carrica and Romero segment, where we examine our monthly political news every last Thursday of the month with board member of the Latino Victory, Ms. Christina Carrica Haley, and executive director at the National Hispanic Caucus of State Legislator, Mr. Kenneth Romero. And since there is so much to cover, they have agreed to come back next week after the election, because again, there's going to be another conversation that's going to need to be had after November 3rd. And I could not think of anybody else but my Garrica and Romero team to come and break it down. Um, because again, everything's going to change in November 3rd. So we will see, we will keep our positives, you know, um, mojo going because that's what we have to do is just stay focused also with us we have a bad beep as brother from another mother who happens to be a state senator in arizona mr tony navarate and i can't wait to share his story and celebrate his accomplishments because to be a state senator in a state like 
Arizona, and uh, somebody of his heritage from beautiful Mexico, that's an accomplishment on his own, right? All of us that have been to Arizona that we understand what's going on. So he is a champion. He has everything. Went, and he is just the nicest, nicest guy that you can trust. Remember when you just trust politicians? That was like a good thing. <laughs> but anyway, Tony is here with us. And you know what? Before we get to our spotlight segment, we have to say hello to our fourth guest, El Presidente, right here. Mm. Right. Listen, this is a classic rum cocktail. It said that it originated in Havana, Cuba in the 1920s, and it was named for President Gerardo Machado. And this is like a great combination of aged rum with dry vermouth and orange curacao, touch of grenadine, and citrus. I mean, it's so good. I got it. Sorry. I got it. Mm. It's so delicious, guys. It's so, so good. Again, two ounces of aged rum, one ounce of dry vermouth, three quarter ounces of curacao, and a dash of grenadine. You know, you can do a spoon, bar spoon, and get the right measurement. Orange twist for your garnish, and that's it. Just mix it up in a beautiful uh, uh, steering glass, and you are set. So salute to everybody out there. I know it's Thursday, and, you know, we have a little bit to, you know, look forward to. Before we get to our spotlight, again, I want to say hi to the Latino Commission on AIDS. Because they had a beautiful gala yesterday. It was their Cielo 30th anniversary gala. And it was virtual. And I think that the team and the benefit committee shout out. Everyone did a magnificent job. Roy Cosme, the chair and creator of the gala, was incredible. Another, like, you know, poop home run. Uh, but we have uh, Roy Guillermo Jai Vargas. Uh, who were here last week, also with Isabel Leonard, a beautiful opera, gorgeous singer. Um, so I just want to say thank you to them, you know, because they were here last week. And now we go to our spotlight, where we highlight our current events and trending news. And, you know, our first story is going to be short, okay? It's going to be short because not we just don't have to spend that much time on it. But it is something uh, worth mentioning. And right-wing judge Amy Coney Barrett, who was sworn in as the ninth justice to the Supreme Court of the United States just 30 days after Trump announced her nomination and eight days ahead of the November 3rd election. Uh, the extremely you know, rushed confirmation to replace uh, the amazing Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Love you just six weeks after her death. And, you know, as tens of millions of people have already cast their ballots, this election season seals the courts six to three to a conservative majority, which can potentially, you know, have major consequences for reproductive rights, for civil rights, environmental protections. I mean, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, so there's a lot that is riding on this, and that's why I'm happy that we have who we have here today. But, you know, to wrap up this circus, I'm going to say, uh, you know, it's surprising to me that Amy Coney Barrett was confirmed a few days ago, particularly given her complete lack of qualifications for the role, but also considering her extreme views on everything from reproductive justice and reproductive rights to civil rights and racism. So we will definitely keep an eye out and we will revisit the Supreme Court after election day, because we're not going to, you know, get all into that when we need to be into this, right? So next we go to an unfortunate, the just unfortunate story uh, out of Philadelphia. And it is uh, Mr. Walter Wallace Jr., rest in peace, who was shot and killed by police. And a warning to our audience, it contains description of police violence and disturbing images. And protesters took to the streets of Philadelphia to condemn the police killings of Walter Wallace Jr. Uh, the National Guard has been deployed to Philadelphia as outrage grows after two Philadelphia police officers shot and killed the 27-year-old father, African-American father, on Monday. Let's show you the video again. Caution.
This cell phone video capturing a chaotic scene in West Philadelphia. A man who officers say was armed with a knife is shot multiple times by police and later pronounced dead at the hospital. That shooting sparked protest and then violence and looting across the city. Several officers were sent to the hospital after they were hit by bricks. A female officer was hit by a pickup truck even. News 4's Ray Vieta has more. Violent protests, dozens of arrests, and 30 officers injured after police shot and killed a man armed with a knife Monday. Yo, watch, yo, watch the world. A witness captured that confrontation on cell phone video. NBC News cannot verify what occurred before or after the events shown in the video. Police say when they arrived, they found a man, later identified as 27 year old Walter Wallace, acting erratically and waving a knife. In the video, you can hear an officer yelling for Wallace to put the knife down as he moves toward them before the officers open fire, killing Wallace. I have directed the officer involved shooting investigation unit to begin its investigation. There are many questions that demand answers. The incident sparking protests and looting overnight. Wallace's lawyer said Tuesday his family was calling for an ambulance to help him with a mental health crisis. But police arrived on the scene instead, and Wallace was at least 10 feet away from the police officers when they shot him. And, you know, again, on Tuesday, uh, Walter Wallace's junior mother, uh, Kathy Wallace, told reporters that officers knew her son was in a mental health crisis because they had been to the family's house three times on Monday, the day before. So what, what, what we clearly see in this case, I think in my opinion um, of Walter Wallace, as opposed to, you know, say Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, uh, which, you know, were acts of horror and terror, uh, is, is that we can't continue to say, let's get rid of the bad apples, right? I think with this case, it's it, it's so uh, important to understand, you know, especially when you see his mom crying, you know, and screaming, that what we see is an institution of policing that is not equipped or designed, for that matter, to deal with mental illness or domestic violence or, you know, homelessness. Uh, so I just think that, you know, that we need to find other solutions, situations that we wrestle with each day. We need special people for that. So we need to reimagine what policing looks like and we definitely need something different. And we hope for the Wallace family, they receive justice and uh, Walter Wallace doesn't just become another hashtag to be quite honest. Um, but you know what guys, that wraps up our spotlight because again, we are going to get into election 2020 with my guests because again, it's truly important to get with what is happening, uh, you know, today. And again, we have the pleasure to bring you guys Carrica and Romero segment. And again, Christina Carrica is the board member of the Latino Victory. Uh, and he is the executive director at the National Hispanic Caucus of State Legislator, Mr. Kenneth Romero. Welcome, you guys. Hey. Hi, hi, hi. Pleasure to be here. How's it going, Kenneth? Ah, it's uh, couldn't be more excited about this uh, year's election. I mean, we're just literally at this point. It's not even days. I'm counting hours to to the election. Um, I actually went to vote yesterday in person, so that was very exciting. I decided to do it the old-fashioned way at a super center here with the National Park, uh, just to go through that experience of uh, seeing what, what it was like. And it was very safe, very secure, uh, and very happy to cast my vote. I love it. How are you, Christina, mi amor? How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Apologies for having a little issue with internet here. So if I pop out, I apologize. But doing well. And I'm with Kenneth. I'm counting down, like cautiously optimistic. Every once in a while, I'm rocking back and forth in the corner. Um, and I've tried to limit uh, my news coverage consumption. But that being said, I don't know about you, Kenneth and, and, and Javier. Like, I, I'm almost tired of seeing voting stickers on social media, but it's the most amazing exhaustion I've ever experienced. You know, you hear stories, whether it was LeBron James saying, you know, talking about his mom the first time voting and all of these different things. And it's just, 
you know, it's inspiring and, mm -hmm. and, and hopefully they're voting the way that will benefit our country the most, but at least, you know, we're seeing Americans exercise their rights. I know it's so early on, right? To see this turnout so early, such a, like, again, a sign of inspiration. But I want to yeah. say salute to you guys because I know you had a rough Ooh. week. Salute, salute, salute. It's going to be rough for a while. But you know exactly. So just <laughs> buckle up. <laughs> exactly. Because it's going to go down. But you know what, everyone? We're going to get started because everyone at home, listen, we understand that there has been so much noise and so much fake news and mixed messages. So listen, today we, Christina, Kenneth, and I have worked on creating a comprehensive list of the top 10 reasons Latinos should vote, why people of color should vote, like everyone who is able to identify themselves with these reasons because we are, again, Nosotros somos hermanos. We are brothers and sisters, and is we want equality for everyone. So we're going to start with Mr. Kenneth. Mr. Kenneth, please do us the honor and tell us, you know, reason number one for Latinos to vote. Sure. So for me, reason number one is we need to vote for those that have lost their jobs during this pandemic. A lot of Hispanics have particularly lost jobs in the last few months. And you have a situation where uh, the HEROES Act, which was um, approved in, in the House, has not seen the light of day in, in the Senate. And so, you know, you have uh, unemployed folks that are not seeing uh, the help they need, right? And so just to bring it home and, and, and to, to explain, I, I know you're gonna have Senator Navarrete talking about Arizona. So let me just, for a second, talk about Florida and what that means in terms of, 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 of the impact to Hispanics. One fourth of Hispanics in, I'm sorry, 1.2 million, let me start by that. 1.2 million people have lost their jobs in Florida, all right? 1.2 million. 25% roughly of that population are Hispanics. Half of them uh, Cuban or Puerto Rican. And so we're talking that a large segment of Hispanics in Florida right now don't have a job and don't have assistance from government to help them through this very difficult time. That's reason number one why I'm voting. Oh my God, extremely, extremely important. Christina, what is your reason and number two? So I think the number two reason we should all think about, it kind of ties into what Kenneth was talking about, right? And, it, and it's all of these businesses that have closed. I think we think about the Latino community, we are entrepreneurs. We are business people. America is built on the backs of small business. And not only is the pandemic causing small businesses to close, but I think we can kind of think beyond that a bit and talk about how hard it is in America for people of color, especially Latinos and Latinas to get access to capital, to open businesses, to keep their businesses open or to grow their businesses. And so not only do we see the failures of um, PPP, which you know was designed by the, the House of Representatives in a bipartisan way and was supposed to be this great thing that was gonna just be there to help keep businesses afloat. And then it was taken by the administration a bunch of unnecessary guard, you know, unnecessary parameters put on it that did not actually help most businesses. And so then you have complete industries like the movie theater industries, independent venues, um, and and many more to the likes of that that are sitting there completely shuttered and unable to get help. And, you know, I can't tell you how many small businesses that fit into every single industry across, you know, the board that haven't been able to survive. And so we need to not only elect people to help us recover, but help us change systemically how we're funding small businesses so that more financial services companies like Mocafi that is run by people of color that is solely focusing on funding businesses uh, for people of color and things like that can continue to grow and prosper. Because if not, you know, America won't be America. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. All right. Now, my number three reason uh, why uh, reasons to vote 
uh, minimum wage is not enough to live. And I think this is something that everyone can relate because a minimum wage worker would have to put in lots of overtime to be able to afford a modest, you know, two bedroom apartment anywhere in the country. Um, and, you know, for most folks, downsizing to a one bedroom pad is just not enough. And it's not where, you know, where we're supposed to be, even with some states hiking, you know, those uh, pay for those earning the least. There is still some place, you know, nowhere in the country where a person working a full time minimum wage job can afford to rent a decent two bedroom. You know, like that is that's crazy to me, you know, to have that. And again, something that is across the board, because, you know, in some of our cost, you know, costliest places like Hawaii, you know, where one would need to make thirty six dollars and 13 cents. Right. Roughly seventy five thousand dollars a year to be able to own um, you know, a, a two bedroom apartment. Uh, the minimum wage there is ten dollars and ten cents. <laughs> yeah. Right. So if we know something like this. Right. We know that these are these are these are facts. These are, you know, like the cheap housing in the U.S., you know, uh, the cheapest is, is in Arkansas, you know, where the minimum wage is eight fifty an hour. Yeah, you one needs to make thirteen eighty four an hour, or roughly twenty nine thousand dollars a year to afford again a two bedroom apartment for a family. That's crazy. Well, and how you know you're not even talking about groceries, electricity, or anything like that. And these are people who are working. You know, you hear people complaining about welfare and people trying to live off the government. That's it's absolutely insane. Absolutely. I'm I'm glad that you I'm glad that you bring that up because. Uh, the reality is that it is completely unacceptable that there are people out there that work from sunrise to sunset and still cannot provide for their families. That is unacceptable. If you work full time, 40 hours a week, every, you know, every single week, you should be able to provide for your family a roof over their heads and food, as Christina was mentioning, and, and be able to cover all the expenses needed. And so that's, I'm so happy that you brought that up, Javier, because that's really important. We need to vote to make sure that those folks that are making minimum wage are able to afford living in America. Absolutely. And you know what? The next one on our list, Kenneth, it goes right along with minimum uh, dollars. Let's talk about our next uh, reason to vote. Next reason to vote is we need to make sure we have a dignified treatment of immigrants. For the last three years, all we've seen is not just rhetoric, anti-immigrant rhetoric, but policies that have particularly impacted our, our, our immigrant community that have been treated. I mean, just think of the cages, right? If there's one reason to vote in this election, it's just those images of children in cages and 525 children that right now have not been able to reconnect with parents, right? Because of these policies and and and, and the way that, you know, and then we talk about the wall and, and there's so many issues and, and the, the, how, you know, the, the, the dream of DACA recipients and, and our beloved dreamers, right? How that has been stripped away. And so now there's this uncertainty. We need to make sure that we elect a, a, a elected officials that will make sure that immigrant rights are respected and upheld. Well, I'm going to jump right in here with the next one, if you don't mind, Javier, as as the only woman here. But it also ties in, you know, with some recent stories that Kenneth just talked about with immigrant women's particularly, but women's rights, right? I mean, it's now even more apparent. We, we lost our warrior. We lost our, you know, day-to-day -day fighter and Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the Supreme Court and got a replacement that is literally the antithesis of everything that Ruth Bader Ginsburg stood for. And, you know, it seems like we're going backwards. And then we start to hear these stories from different um, detention centers where immigrant women are getting um, almost secretive and, and, and unknowingly be getting hysterectomies. So getting organs removed, <laughs> reproductive organs removed without even knowing. So let's not even touch 
the ability to access birth control if you can afford it, because we all know that the Trump administration is also trying to to curb you know healthcare to the point where if you know it won't cover birth control. And let's not even talk about people who need abortions for health rights. We are literally taking organs out of women because I guess the government wants to. And, and it, it's it's almost laughable in the sense when, when you hear the Republicans say, oh, we don't want the government. We don't want government in our lives. And yet the government is determining what organs women are allowed to have or you know what you're allowed to do as far as reproduction goes. It's absolutely absurd. And I would be remiss not to mention that today is Latina Equal Pay Day. And the reason that it is October 29th is because it would take us the entire year of 2019 and up until October 29th of the following year in order to make the same amount that a white man in our same job makes because we make 59 cents on the hour. And so it's things like that, that, you know, it touches our everyday lives and, and and unfortunately you know women it touches our lives in so many different ways including what we can do with our bodies and how we can make money for our families so without a doubt that's a huge reason for us all not just women to vote but the men who care about women to vote yep yep and you know what you hit it on the next then our next point number six is health care and a lot of what you covered is part of why we need to be looking at our healthcare systems, why we need to be looking at this current administration, just take COVID, for example, and how it has been handled. And what if we did not have the Obamacare Act, right? I still haven't seen another choice, right? We're still waiting for this magical plan, the Trump whatever, and it's not coming out. So I want people to, you know, again, uh, is also worth mentioning our trans brothers and sisters and siblings. And if they want to, you know, again, talking about surgeries and all that, I want everyone to be covered. So I think healthcare is a huge reason to vote this uh, uh, election. Yep. Uh, and, I, and, and, and in that topic, it's important that we need to make sure that uh, Hispanics in particular have access to affordable and quality health care, right? And I know that, for example, in the Democratic Party, there's different views as to what that would look like. But overall, everyone agrees that we need to provide this as, as a human right, right? Health care should be a human right. That's right. That's well, right. and, and I think we need to also mention um, the fact that of the misinformation that's out there about healthcare as well, right? Whether or not you're on the spectrum of wanting universal healthcare or not, or what have you, the Biden administration is not going to take healthcare from anybody. If you have employer provided healthcare, you can keep it. Now, some employers might not provide the type of healthcare you want. And therefore with these changes and with the ACA, you're able to then go and choose on a marketplace other forms of healthcare. And therefore, hopefully more and more healthcare providers will be forced to offer affordable programs in order to attract and keep customers. And so really it's 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 kind of a, um, a melding of a, of a business and healthcare world where, you know, we'll take care of each other, we'll figure it out, but it, we've got to make it affordable. And we can't, like you said, wait for a magical plan that doesn't exist. Right, exactly. Oh my God, I love this reason. I got to tell you, like, I'm I'm sure people are already like, thank you, thank you, thank you, because this makes it so uh, understandable, right, and comprehensible. Um, Kenneth, take us to our reason number seven, why Latinos need to vote. This one uh, hits home very, you know, it's very dear to my heart, and that is the fact that 3.2 million Boricuas living in the island of Puerto Rico cannot vote in a presidential term where they were impacted by uh, the devastation of hurricanes Irma and, and then Maria, and then saw paper towels being thrown at them, right? Uh, I think that we need to make sure as, as Latinos that we're voting for those folks, particularly I would say Latinos, not just in Florida, but also in Georgia, uh, Texas, there's a lot of Boricuas there. Pennsylvania, full of Boricuas. You need to go out and vote for those Boricuas, right? To make yes. sure more than anything 
that th that that is uh, addressed, right? That there's still people in Puerto Rico that are living with blue tarps over their heads, and so the Rico and schools, today, right? There's still some schools that haven't been rebuilt. Yeah, right. And so so we need to make sure that the recovery. Uh, takes place for the island and that we make sure that this doesn't happen again because God forbid a hurricane were to hit Puerto Rico uh, next year or the year after, we need to make sure that there's a government that will be there to respond immediately because these are not just human beings, they're American citizens, right? Yeah. And so this is important because it's not only not, not only for Puerto Ricans in the island, not only for Puerto Rican family members that live in the mainland, this is an issue that's important to all Hispanics because we're not a monolithic uh, community, right? There's uh, Venezuelans, there's Cubans, there's Argentinians, there's Colombians, there's, you know, Mexican. But at the end of the day, we stand united when it comes to our issues. You do harm to one of us, you're doing harm to everyone else in, in our community, right? And so... This one, I remember back in the day when, when those images started coming across the, the, the uh, uh, TV and you, would, you heard and you saw how the Hispanic community came all together and they, they were all united and, and, and advocating and calling for government to provide a, 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 the adequate response. And we, and we didn't see that happening. So that's another reason to vote the 3.2 million American citizens living in the island of Puerto Rico that cannot vote. Absolutely, yep. Yes. Perfect, perfect, perfect. The next point is LGBTQ equality. LGBTQ plus equality. Guys, I will tell you as a gay man, lesbians, gay, bisexual, transgender people want equal rights, not special rights, we just want equal rights. And in many states, however, discrimination based on, you know, sexual orientation, gender identity is still legal. And an LGBT person can get kicked out of a school, can, you know, fired from a job or denied housing simply because of who they love or who they express their, you know, ex ex how they express their gender. Like, this is this is an extremely important, especially with what nine million of us in this country that we vote for people who are about equality, and that is equality for all, right? Not well, and it takes you back to your first story that you covered, and now that we have a completely conservative majority in the Supreme Court, you know, there's a ton of things that can be overturned, and and the rights, especially the LGBTQ community, are are at risk. Absolutely, and you know, like you we said, you know, who if we are friends to women and we're allies to our Afro, this is the same thing as an ally and a friend to LGBTQ plus people in your life, you need to take a stand for fairness and join in the fight for equality. And the way that you do that is by voting for the person who, who is going to support that vision. Go ahead, Kenneth. And who is that person? <laughs> and, who is it? We just need to hear it just in case. I didn't hear it, but I just, okay, that's how we going. <laughs> and what are you going to say, Kenneth? To, Chris, to Christina's point, you know, right now, after losing Ruth Bader Ginsburg, right, and now with the confirmation of uh, Justice Barrett, marriage equality runs a risk of being, right? And so, you know, it's, it's incredible that uh, nowadays, We've seen, I mean, in, in, in recent years, recent decades, a progress when it comes to civil rights, every type of civil right, including LGBTQ rights, and we cannot risk going back in time. And so, you know, when, when you're voting, you're also voting for those that then get to confirm judges uh, in, 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 at every level of the federal court system, but more, most importantly, to the Supreme Court, right? So that's something that's very important. Yeah, and in, and in most states, same-sex couples still cannot get married. It's still legally, it's not, you know what I'm saying? So you cannot legally marry. So we're still fighting these things, right? Like, we're still going ahead. So that's why it's extremely important to vote for someone who is or is an ally and advocate to 
all of our rights. We get to the next one, number nine, Ms. Christina. Go ahead. I'll go ahead and take this. I also have the sign in the back if we need to remember, but racial justice. I don't think there's, you know, and, and I can't say this, I was not alive in the 60s and, and I've got to, you know, put a little anecdote out there, but at this point in time in my life, this has been the most highlighted period of time where racial justice, you know, is just undeniably the most poignant issue we need to deal with right away. Um, I have heard, and obviously my dog cares about it as well. And I've heard, of, you know, from several folks and different stories and whether you're Afro Latino, whether you're, you know, an indigenous person, whether you are black, because I've heard so many countless accounts of how people don't want to be referred to as African-Americans anymore. Some people, some people do. And it's just been eye-opening for me. Um, it's particularly, I've done work with, you know, growing up in a community that is very mixed. I've, I've seen it firsthand, but then doing a lot of work now, being out there in the protests, being there on June 1st, when the president gassed us, used, <laughs> used you know, sound bomb, flash bombs, whatever they're called, to get a, a photo op when people were just out there asking for people to treat those with a different complexion with the same rights. And I say this as a Latina, but I say this fully well aware as a Latina who has white privilege. Presenting as white in this country gives me a step up, whether I want it or not. I can't deny it and no white woman can. White women have to be at the forefront of this argument. We are part of a system here in the United States that was built to protect white women at all costs. And a lot of times at unnecessary costs. And if white women, including white Latinas and other white minorities don't step up, speak out and, and really move forward, vote it, it being the most important thing. So every time Trump says suburban women, what he's saying is white women and white women are the ones who voted for Trump before. And then they get outraged and then they're so shocked. You know, I was talking to, to Ray Allen, the former NBA player the other day, he was doing an event with us for Biden. And he's talking about how he was golfing with the president of the United States and Michael Jordan. At a Michael Jordan golf uh, course, and I promise this has a point to it. And the, the, the general manager of the golf course and his wife joined them for dinner. They happen to be white. The white woman goes, I am so shocked at what's been going on that this just came out of nowhere. And they all just went, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> came out, I'm sorry, it came out of nowhere? Again. Right, I'm, I, I'm sorry, did we, did we forget slavery? Did we forget segregation? Did we forget the segregation that's still happening in our public school systems? Did we forget all of these things that have been happening for decades or centuries? And, and white women's... Um, ignorance uh, to these issues that really causes the problem. Because if a system is made to protect you and you're not bringing in others to be protected, it's our problem. And so, you know, racial justice stems across, you know, a million different platforms. But right now, we have to understand that the Black Lives Matter movement is out there for a reason. It's not something made up. It's not a bunch of angry people wanting, like you said, any additional rights. It's wanting the chance for your for African American children to grow up without being scared of being killed if they're having a mental health issue or if they're just driving home in their nice car. You know, and 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 I could go. We could go on for hours about this, Kenneth. I mean, we've we've discussed this before, and the marches and everything like that. We can't put enough emphasis on how important it is to treat everybody in this country with the same respect. Yes. And you know, all of that, all of <laughs> I, I, we need to get all I tried of to that. cut it down and I no, still cut it. <laughs> like, don't cut nothing. Because, you know, one of the things that people need to understand with racial justice is that American, you know, history itself, it began with the creation of a myth to absolve white settlers of the genocide of the Native Americans, right? So you want to take it all the way back, okay? Because that's how far racial injust uh, injustices have been happening in this country. So the false belief that non-white people are less human than white people didn't come from Black people. No. 
And yeah. like, uh, I mean, saying that racial justice is an issue that is also uh, particularly had an impact on the on the Hispanic community, right? Uh, going to soon have Senator Tony Navarrete, who's from Arizona, the the, the home of Joe Arpaio, right? And just the way that Hispanics have been mistreated when they encounter uh, law enforcement, right? This, this is something that has also impacted us, uh, you know, across across the United States, and we need to make sure that black and brown stand together. Yes. But as, as Christina is saying, we also need for our allies, for, for white folks to join us in this, we need to once and for all have racial justice and racial equity for everyone. Because it's, it goes to what you were saying before, Javier, it's not about special rights, it's not about special treatment. It's about equal treatment. It's about equality for all. It's about being able to walk down the street and knowing that you're not going to be stopped, that you're not going to be put at risk of losing your life just because you happen to be brown or black. Correct. And enslavement, you know, enslavement happened. That happened to us too. You know, we can go through the, the, the list of the horrible things that have happened to our African brothers and sisters. And we can't, I can tell you that we've been in that fight with them since the beginning of time, right? <laughs> like since this all started. So that, so I think it's a really good point kind of that you made of us sticking together the brown and black communities, because there is power in numbers. And when we all understand that something that helps the LGBTQ plus community is going to help the black community, is going to help this community and this community and that community and this community, it's going to help us all because it's all about equality, right? Let's take it to reason number 10. And I'm going to give Kenneth the pleasure of introducing reason number 10. <laughs> All right, I need a drum roll for this one. Right? So reason number 10, and the most important reason why we need to go out and vote, because Walter Mercado said so. Prepárate para un año donde tienes que votar. Tú tienes que dar ese primer paso, atreverte para cumplir con todo lo que sean obligaciones y responsabilidades. Virgo, Escorpio, Pisces, Acuario, Géminis, Tauro, Capricornio, Cáncer, Libra, Aries, Leo, Sagitario pueden aprovechar este año y votar con mucho, mucho, mucho amor. All right, listen, we heard it from Walter. You know, who else is going to come back from the afterlife but listen, Walter to tell us? We're going to do it with mucho, mucho, mucho amor, homie girl, right? I mean, mucho, hello. Mucho. <laughs> I love it. Well, guys, there you have your top 10 reasons. To vote, there are many more, okay? But this is an hour show. But <laughs> we, there are many, many more for you to vote. If you guys have any questions on that, you already know our DMs. We're going to share that at the end of the show again for you guys. But really, get to know your candidates. Understand the policies. Literally compare policies side to side. Immigration, healthcare, education. Just go down the line. And, and let's not forget, also check out your local races as well. I think that's something that we, we oftentimes, you know, the presidency is super important, but there's also a reason for the people who are, who are working those two or three jobs because minimum wage isn't enough and things like that. They can't show up to school board elections or to school board meetings. They can't show up to their, you know, county kind of question and answer sessions. So you need to elect people that are going to be there that care about what you care about. And then you don't have to spend time doing that. And you don't have to feel bad that you can't be there. So you need to really check out your state and local races as well. And a lot of them, going back to racial justice, have to deal with law enforcement. And they're the ones who will punish and make sure that the people who are using law enforcement in, in the wrong ways and or killing people are not there anymore. But you have to vote for them. 
And one important thing, right, is also we need to make sure that we're voting for people that look like us. Look yeah. at the ballot and look, look for Latino and Latina candidates and support them. It's very important because they will have a seat in that table of power where decisions are made that impact you, your family, your community. And what better thing than to have somebody from your community representing you, right? And advocating for you. So uh, that's why I'm so excited about your next guest because we need to be to vote for people that look like us and that will champion for us. I, oh my God, it's like, you took my intro away. I swear to God, like I am literally, is literally why I'm so excited as well that we have Mr. Tony Navarrete, guys. And for you, for you just so you have a little knowledge about him, he was born and raised in Arizona to immigrant parents. He currently serves as a state senator for Arizona's 30th district and sits on various committees ranging from ranking member of the commerce, uh, health and human services, higher education and workforce development. So listen, off the hook. And he looks like my cousin. Deal with it. Listen, <laughs> we're going to take a break and we're going to refill these cocktails and then we're going to come back. We all coming back with Mr. Tony Navarrete. So come back with us. Welcome to your new you with Aspire by Solivity. Virtual inspiration for your mind, body, and soul. With the help of at-home experts and celebrity guests, Aspire by Solivity provides tools to tap into the passion and purpose that lives within you. Find classes to educate and motivate you from nutrition to your body and a whole lot more. Take the leap. Start your new journey with Aspire by Solivity today. Sign up now. Have you ever asked the question, if I was to be anything, what would I be? Regardless of money, regardless of status, beyond popularity and fame, living your passion, feeling your life has purpose. So liberty is a space to nurture that which lives in all of us. A place where work can become play and doing what we love creates the dreams of a lifetime. All right, familia, we are back and we are back with Tony Navarrete. What's going on, Tony? Well, you know, I'm sure I'm a lot warmer than where you are here in Arizona. So it's been, it's nice and sunny still. The sun is still out. And, you know, we're still hitting the ground and knocking on doors to get out the vote. Rub it uh, in, Senator. Rub it in. It's fine. Exactly. Please say hello to Ms. Christina Carrica Haley and Kenneth Romero, who do you know very well? I do. I do. Hola, Christina. And Hola. Kenneth, of course, you know, I work real closely with him at the National Hispanic Caucus of State Legislators. So happy to be on with you all. And thank you for the kind words. I, I was I was tuning in and listening to what you were saying. So thank you. That, that means a lot. Well, I'm only speaking the truth, you know, <laughs> so it makes it really easy to say who you are. And when when Christina and Kenneth and I started talking about this program, let's call it, or this segment of like bringing in and highlighting uh, folks in politics, uh, you know, who are brown and beautiful, uh, black and gorgeous and everything, right? So we want to highlight so how people can get to know all of you guys because you're doing such an amazing job. You're up for re-election. How are you feeling about I, this election? 
I, you know, I feel really good. So, you know, I first got elected elected in 2016, and, you know, that was a really competitive race. We actually came in third place um, during the primary, but after all the ballots were counted, we went from third place to first place with 32 votes. You know, we also dedicated ourselves to making sure that we were registering voters in our community. And my goal ever since I've been elected was to continue to beat those records every single election. And I can tell you already, even though, you know, we're not even done with the election and we've already surpassed the numbers in 2016, 2018. So our community is blowing it out of the water. And a little bit about our neighborhood is, you know, it's the most diverse legislative district in the state of Arizona. There's around 230,000 people. It's a majority minority community. And I'm just super proud. And as, as a senator for this community, and mind you, these are the streets I grew up on. It's so encouraging to see so many families just engaged and excited about this election and ready to give Donald Trump the boot, quite frankly. Um, and I'm with them. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm with them. Absolutely. And you know what? You're giving me goosebumps because I, the way you're saying, I know for some people is their worst nightmare that you're the minority are becoming the majority. And, you know, that is something that is something that we're all going to have to have a conversation about sooner or later. But you're currently the chair of the Latino Voting Task Force at the National Hispanic Caucus of State Legislator. I'm wondering what are some of the key issues for Hispanics in Arizona and across the nation that are motivating them to vote in this year's election? Well, you know, ever since Donald Trump said that he was going to run for president back in 2015, he pretty much came out of the gate calling Mexicans rapists and drug dealers. And, and again, in Arizona, there's a lot of Mexicans over here. And in the west of the Mississippi, there's a ton of Mexicans. So we took that, we took those words very personally, and we geared up. We made sure that not only were American citizens that had already been voting in the 2016 election, we're going to give them the boot in 20, 2020, but we dedicated ourselves to making sure that we were focusing on turning these permanent residents into United States citizens. And over between, the, between 2014 to 2020, we have naturalized over 86,000 new citizens in the state of Arizona. So the issues around immigration continue to be a, a, a hot topic. Again, um, I, I, when I was watching the show earlier, I, I heard Kenneth Romero mention that we still have over 500 young kids. These are babies. These are kids that are that we can't even find their parents. Can you imagine what that is like, not knowing where your parents are? How frustrating, so frustrating. So, you know, our community is ready to, you know, to roll over this president. We're ready to, you know, knock him out of the White House. And, you know, on top of that, you know, healthcare is a huge issue. And the fact that, you know, we just, you know, we, the Republican senators um, just appointed, uh, you know, Amy Baird to the Supreme Court, this is, this is part of their plan to stack the courts. You know, Republicans here in the state of Arizona have stacked the state Supreme Court. We're seeing Republicans stack the United States Supreme Court. And again, this is all to make sure that they are attacking our voting rights, that they are going after our health care, that they are going after our vulnerable communities, the LGBTQ. You know, we can go on and on and on. And, and you know, I, I'm with Christina. You know, we also have to protect our women. And part of that process is making sure that we're pushing back against this president. But again, what, what excites me and gives me so much um, passion and joy is looking at the returns of people that are voting in the state of Arizona. Up until, you know, in, in the past, um, in 2016, 1.6 million people voted early prior to the general election. Already, we are past 2.2 million votes, and we still have five days to go. So we are ready to just tear down the house and, you know, and making sure that we are electing, you know, for me, Democrats all across the board, people that, re that support the LGBTQ community, people that respect the dignity of people from immigrant communities, you know, people that respect women. Again, there's a lot of work that we need to do, but I love working with Kenneth and I've seen the work that Christina has done. And it's just exciting to just be here with all of you and talking about the great work that many organizations and elected leaders in Arizona are doing to begin to move forward um, Arizona so that we are, we are a much better state that supports and reflects its community. Yeah, and you said it, familia, you know, when you talk about, you know, um, the Mexican babies being separated and all that, you know, like Kenneth was speaking before, we unite. Like, I'm Puerto Rican and Colombian, and I feel your pain so hard as because it is our people. 
it is our people. And you mentioned healthcare, you know, in response to COVID-19, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention came out with recommendations for early voting and voting by mail when possible, right? When, uh, you know, we know that Arizona instituted a permanent early voting list and also known as the PEVL, right? And my question is what automatically, like what I want to know in, in specifically to Arizona is considering the high rate of COVID, have Arizona embraced and taken advantage of voting by mail this year? Well, you know, I can tell you this. Um, in Maricopa County, which is the fourth largest county in, in the country and the second largest voting county in the country, um, the New York Times just came out and said that our recorder's office is the number one most secure and most prepared elections department in the entire country. Arizona has a rich history in terms of voting early. So for us, this is not this is not a surprise. Over 80% of our of our families have already been voting early in Arizona since, you know, since the mid-2000s. And you know, we still we have, we have a lot, long way to go. But in terms of COVID here in the state of Arizona, you know, we have a Republican governor, a Republican legislature that has not taken this virus seriously. And that's why you saw early in June and July. You know, we lost so many lives here in the state of Arizona, and it has been disgusting, 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 because these are families that are in our communities. These are my constituents. These are people that I know that are my friends. And it's so frustrating to continue to see these massive super spreader events being hosted by Donald Trump in Arizona, being co-hosted by our governor, Doug Ducey, who today on our press conference, is, um, you know, is making decisions for the entire educational system. And mind you, in Arizona, the majority of students in the K through 12 system are Latino. And so when he's making decisions without even consulting the state superintendent, without consulting other educational leaders, it's ridiculous. It's disrespectful. And he obviously doesn't have a good grip on COVID-19 response. And our, you know, our caucus, because I'm also the co-chair of the Latino caucus in Arizona, our job is to make sure that we're continuously putting that pressure on the governor because it's it's our folks that are being most disproportionately impacted. It's our folks that are losing their jobs. It's our folks that don't have access to those unemployment benefits. It's our folks that are making that are that are losing their homes that can't be able to provide for their families. And it's so frustrating. But again, this is why this election is so critical, not just in Arizona, but all across the country. I know Kenneth mentioned Florida. Um, and the job loss that the Latino community has seen there as well. This election is the election of our lifetime, and we have to make sure that we are prepared to make sure that we are pulling out every single one of our families to vote in this election, avoid the misinformation, and focus on a vote that's going to support our families. And as we know, Mark Kelly has... Can I step in real quick to ask a question? Just because before we get off of that, you mentioned Maricopa County, and, and I don't think a lot of people who don't live in Arizona understand how important that is, right? It's... And am I right in this? And I almost want to hear from you. I don't think anybody has ever won one statewide or won the state without winning Maricopa County, correct? It only it only happened once and it happened wow. back in 2004. Um, but you're right, Maricopa County, everyone is looking at this county. Like I mentioned, it's the second largest voting county in the entire country. Mm -hmm. And right now, Democrats and Republicans are in dead heat in terms of the return ballots. Mind you, Republicans have you know, a significant lead in terms of voter registrations. But when you look at all of the total state um, returns in terms of party, Democrats are still up 50,000 votes. And that is, mind you, it doesn't determine who's voting, but it just gives you a, an idea of where the energy is in this election. We can't let up, of course. You know, Every single day I tell our team, we need to double down. We need to knock on more doors. We need to flyer more people. We need to get that word out. Because again, this election is no joke. We have to make sure that we're turning out and voting for our families. Yep. And you know, for those of you at home, it's 659, but stay on because we stay for another 10 minutes because it's too much to talk and I can't. It would just be rude as hell and it was not happening. But it's just too and good. And we wouldn't it's be Latinos if we ended on time. I'm so We started kidding. on time. Hey. Hey, no empieza la conversación en español. No más Cuando quieras. Podemos hablar español cuando <laughs> but listen, I want to talk about Mark Kelly because I know that he jumped into your into the race, right, mm -hmm. with the name recognition and, you know, being an astronaut and the fact that he's married to a former congresswoman, you know, Gabby Gifford. It looks like Kelly is likely to flip the Senate seat, right? So uh, how is that race helping Biden's chance in Arizona? 
Well, again, you know, in Arizona, and I heard I heard you mention in the segment earlier, but Arizona has seen leadership like Trump here in the state of Arizona. We've seen the former mm-hmm. sheriff Joe Arpaio in this community target um, immigrants and people of color. We've seen Andrew Thomas, Jan Brewer, who was a governor who signed SB 1070, and Russell Pierce, who was the author and the mastermind behind SB 1070, which is the Show Me Your Papers bill back in 2010. And what happened after that is that it encouraged so many young people and communities of color to begin to register to vote, to begin to organize, to begin to take on power. And in 2016, we started removing folks by recalling them. In 20, um, I'm sorry, that was in 2011. In 2016, we gave um, uh, Jorah Pyle the boot. There is so much energy in Arizona. And one of the things that I've always said when I've traveled around and when I've talked to other folks is that Arizona is the place to be when we're talking about the changes that are occurring. We've already seen a Donald Trump in our state. So we're going to continue to promote and support Mark Kelly in this election. And it's what's what's been really interesting is that Mark Kelly has been an incredible fundraiser. He has had so much support across the state. And mind you, he's a national hero. He's been to space. He's a, you know, he's a he's a combat pilot as well. He's just, you know, and, and he's married to Gabby Giffords, who's also been a treasure here in the state of Arizona. So there's so much talent just, you know, with him, with him. And, you know, Donald Trump was here this week. Uh, he was also here last week, or his team was here last week, saying that they were having LGBTQ community for Donald Trump. Again, that is a complete joke. You know, he has he has literally attacked the LGBTQ community every single year, every single month of his administration. Right. But he literally called out um, our, our appointed senator, Martha McSally, and was just treating her like crap, quite frankly, at one of the rallies. It was, it was I don't insane. Know if it was insane. It was insane. Nobody wants to hear from you. That's literally what he said. Yeah, he's like, come on, come on. You got one minute and nobody wants to hear from you. Just come on. Come on stage. Hurry up. Do your wow. thing. Do your thing. Hurry up and get out. Crazy. It was wild. And again, you know, Trump is trash. So like I can't, you know, it's hard for me to, you know, th- what else do you expect from this from this president? Exactly. Exactly. But you know what? You mentioned t- 2016 when and you were elected for the first time as Senate representative. And in record time, you moved up. And you were elected state senator because you were a bad mom, you know what I mean? So now it looks like Democrats are likely to flip both houses in Arizona. This is crazy. Tell us about those prospects and some of the policy, you know, uh, priorities you will be focused on when you become the new majority. Absolutely. I think for, you know, for us, we're super excited to flip the chambers, um, both in the House of Representatives and the State Senate. It hasn't happened in over 50 years. This is ridiculous. And mind you, over the last 30 years, we have been cutting taxes in the state of Arizona, 29 of the last 30 years. It is unacceptable. And our kids are the ones that are dealing with the brunt of that consequence. So, you know, God willing, everything goes well on Tuesday. We're not, you know, leaving any stone unturned. We're going to keep hustling doubly down every single day because I want to get into the majority so that we can finally fight for comprehensive, you know, I mean, for for criminal justice reform so that we can address our our academic shortages, you know, in terms of funding so that we can begin to address some of our environmental issues. We are a desert. You know, we depend, you know, a lot on the Colorado River, Lake Mead, and there's, you know, the water is becoming depleted. And we are also the fastest growing county in the entire union. So what that means is that housing is becoming very unaffordable for many families. So we need to talk about how we're going to deal with housing. But above all of this, you know, we still have a pandemic that we're in the middle of. We have to deal with COVID-19. We have a ton of businesses that are losing, you know, that are closing down permanently. And that is just going to have a huge ripple effect. So for us, it's making sure that we are supporting our families on the front lines, that we're making sure that we're supporting our small businesses, because what we learned during, or at least what I learned during the last recession, is that communities of color are the ones that are going to take the biggest brunt of the, of the, of the losses. And the, re- the revenue that, I mean, the, the wealth that we've created from the recession up until, you know, prior to this pandemic was huge. Right. What's happening is that we just erased so much of that. So we want, we, as government, we need to make sure that we are stepping in, you know, and preparing, you know, for this long extended fight with COVID-19. So we're prepared. We're ready. We're ready to lead. We've been ready to lead. You know, we can, we're going to continue to um, push and advocate for families here in the state of Arizona. doesn't matter what color you are, you know, what your, um, you know, what your sexual orientation is. doesn't matter, you know, what language you speak. Again, we are all one Arizona and we have to make sure that we're fighting for a better tomorrow for all of us. Can, can I ask a question? To Absolutely. This? We're talking uh-huh. about Kelly. So I hear that 
Congressman Ruben Gallego, if Biden gets elected, might be part of that cabinet. But, we're, but, here. We're, here, we're, we're hearing that. We're hearing lots of rumors. And again, you know, for us, our main priority is to focus on the win. You know, I think I think four years ago, what we saw was, you know, I think we're all preparing for this win of Hillary Clinton and that didn't happen. So for me, you know, I tell my team, close your ears, focus, 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 keep knocking on those doors. And then afterwards, we're going to decide, you know, what happens and, you know, whatever, however the chips fall, um, you know, we're going to make sure that we're supporting our local Arizona leadership so that we can step up into the role so that we're better serving the state of Arizona. And I can tell you, with Congressman Gallego, he is one of the, the biggest allies, supporters, and hardest workers for the Biden campaign and national campaigns around the country. I know he will be taking over um, Bold Pack, which is the Congressional Hispanic Caucus's political arm, come next cycle. And he has been obviously all over Arizona whenever the Biden team was there, but he was also um, this week in uh, down in South Florida helping Debbie Marcus L. Powell and all over the country really, to, you know, working to make sure that all of our community um, congressmen and women get reelected or those that are, you know, trying to get elected for the first time are successful. So you guys have a gem there. Yeah. Uh, with yes. An expert on foreign policy. I mean, we're talking about somebody, the Harvard grad. He's a former Marine, served yep. on this country. He's a, he's a veteran from Iraq, Afghanistan. I mean, just talk about- His the, mom is Colombian. Hello. You know? I know. Hello. Yeah, well, well, you know, I'm ready to do that. Yeah. And not to throw shade, not to throw shade at anybody else, but it's so funny. Nobody talks about all of his accomplishments. And yet his resume is oddly similar, if not a little bit better than a mayor from a slightly more Northern state who ran for president and everybody fawns over it. And listen, as we should. However, we have people in our community that have the same exact resumes and accolades, if not better, that don't get the chance. And I think Ruben is a perfect example of that. And, and again, not to take anything away from Mayor Pete, we love him, however, our people like Ruben and others should get the same recognition for their resumes as well. I, I think actually interesting note, they actually graduated in, in the same class from Harvard. Exactly. But exactly. I mean, I mean, as as a policymaker, Congressman Gallego has that experience, that foreign policy experience that is so critical as we lead this nation, because we need to understand that whether it be in state capitals like Tony or in the nation's capital, like Congressman Gallego, right? Our community and our policymakers are not just single issue legislators or members of Congress, right? Mm -hmm. It's they, they, you know, yes, we, we work around issues like immigration policy, but we do so much more and we're capable of doing so much more. So we need to be the first one to uh, make sure that people understand that our members of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, for example, and our members in, in state capitals are so knowledgeable in a wide array of issues. And Congressman Gallego is the best example of that. Absolutely. And, that, and that's something that we're always constantly sharing. It's like, we have the expertise in our community. You know, just talk to us, bring us in. And if not, we're going to work our way and make sure that we're putting ourselves in positions of power so that we can lead our community, so that we can lead our country. Um, you know, we're all, again, we're all in this as we're all in this together and we need to continue to elevate that local leadership within our community so that we are building that power and we are building the bench so that we can continue to have generations of leaders that are ready to serve um, our communities and protect the most vulnerable of our, of our, of our, of our, of our states. And you know what, lastly, again, I wish we had a two hour show because this is some BS, but lastly, Tony, I want, I want, you know, what do Latinos need to do between now and November 3rd, this next Tuesday, right? Everybody remember calendars. Turn out in Arizona and nationwide. What is tu mensaje? What is your message? You know, my message is if you have an early ballot or you want to know where your polling place is, visit iwillvote.com. If you are in Maricopa County, visit locations.maricopa.vote. It's so critical for everyone to cast their ballot in this historic election. We have a duty, we have a responsibility to make sure that we are creating a more perfect union and making sure that we are creating a generations, you know, a better country for the future generations to come. So, Javier, you know, it's been such a you know pleasure to be on your show. I want to I want to share off my shirt that we just got here. It's democracy is not boring. 
Yes. Uh, <laughs> Eat those shirts. Yeah. Yeah. Shirts. yeah. So you know, maybe I'll see if I can hook, um, you know, save some aside so I can send one to all. all la familia, la familia. <laughs> all right, guys. Listen. Thank you so much, all three of you. Again, guys, to our guests, Christina, Kenneth, and Tony, for joining us today's episode and for using their their lives, their personal stories, their brains, not only to create opportunities, but also empower every human being they come across and for creating social change. When in the future, when you say, hey, how did that change? It is possibly going to be one of these three folks has something to do with it, right? And we have to think of that because like Tony just said, we have to leave a better planet for the next generations to come. The reason why we're not living our best lives is because the generations prior to ours did not take care of business and did not take care of what they needed to take care of. And now we're stuck with it. But gladly we take on the, war, the, the fight. We are here and we are the ancestors of these beautiful folks that we all love and we all know the histories of. So again, Go out there and vote, vote, vote. Make sure that your abuelita is voting because you are taking her, your tia, your prima, everyone. Please make sure that this is the year to vote for what you're looking for. And everyone, again, wear your mask because we've read numbers. We're telling you how many lives we can save, okay, by wearing a mask. So right now we leave you with a beautiful video from our friend here at CO3, Don Castor, who has created a beautiful, beautiful uh, project, a project of love, uh, because he's a, a, an artist, he's a singer, and he was like, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? And what you're about to see is what he did. So again, mi gente, make sure that you tune in next week because we're going to have Kenneth and Christina back with us because we don't know what's going to happen November 3rd and I can't do it alone. I just can't do it alone. I need my people to break it down with me. So make sure that next week you are here with us. Again, mi amor, stay curious. Remember, just always stay curious. Be gorgeous y amable. We'll leave you here with the video. Adios. We'll see you next week. Thank you, guys. Bastos, besos. When was America great again? Why we got less young brown men in college right now than in the pen? When was America great again? White color crimes, the laws just ban and ban. A different apartheid you can't defend. And when you can't breathe, you can't pretend. When was America great again? When will America be great?